Hi everyone, this is Professor M. Science, and today I want to prove the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in another one of our videos on rigorous quantum mechanics. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle is one of the most famous results in the whole of physics. The aim of this video is straightforward. We go over the mathematical proof of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So the emphasis today is on the maths rather than the physics. For a full discussion of the physical implications of the principle, there is a companion video that I encourage you to check out. Let's go! Let's start by stating the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Many of you will have encountered it before, stated as delta x times delta p larger than or equal to 1 half times h bar. In this expression, delta x and delta p are the root mean square deviations of these two observables, and we typically call them the uncertainty in x and the uncertainty in p. Using this language, the expression tells us that the product of these two uncertainties has a non-zero lower bound, h bar over 2. It turns out that it is just a special case of the uncertainty principle, and in reality there is an uncertainty principle for any pair of observables a and b. The most general form of the uncertainty principle says that the root mean square deviation of observable a multiplied by the root mean square deviation of observable b is larger than or equal to 1 half times the absolute value of the expectation value of the commutator of a and b. The key quantities in the Heisenberg uncertainty principle are the delta a and delta b, which are the root mean square deviations of these two operators. Remember that the root mean square deviation delta a of an operator a for a system in state psi is equal to the square root of the expectation value of sigma a squared, where sigma a is equal to a minus the expectation value of a. And remember also that we can write delta a as equal to this. In today's video, I'll assume that you are familiar with these expressions. If you aren't, then you should first check the video on expectation values, which you can find linked in the description. Going back to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, there is a companion video in which we go over what the uncertainty principle means from a conceptual point of view. What I want to do in this video is to show the mathematical proof of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle here. So if all you want is a conceptual understanding of the principle, feel free to stop watching now and go to the companion video. However, if what you're looking for is to learn where the uncertainty principle comes from, then you should definitely join me in the derivation. I actually think it's quite fun. To prove the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, we need a number of intermediate results, and we start with the Schwarz inequality. Consider state chi given by the linear superposition of state psi and another state alpha phi. Using the positivity property of the scalar product, we know that the bracket of chi with itself is larger than or equal to zero. Plugging in the definition of chi, we get this. And multiplying through, we get these four terms. Feel free to pause here for a second to cross-check this, but it should be clear after a moment. Now this relation is true for any scalar alpha, so in particular it is true for this choice of alpha, which you should convince yourself is just a scalar. Plugging in this alpha, we get these new four terms. Again, feel free to pause here and convince yourself of this step. Moving on, we recall that the conjugate of a bracket simply exchanges the terms, and that as a consequence, we can write the absolute value squared of a bracket like this. We can now write this whole expression in this more compact form, with the first term here staying unchanged, the second term here gives this, the third term here gives this, the fourth term here gives this and then all of this is larger than or equal to zero. This term now cancels with this term, and rearranging we get that psi psi times phi phi is larger than or equal to the absolute value squared of psi phi. This final result is what we call the Schwarz inequality, and it actually appears in many areas of mathematics. What we have here is the result in the context of state vectors in state space relevant for quantum mechanics. To make progress, consider two observables a and b, with the associated operators sigma a 
and sigma b. Sigma a dagger is equal to a minus the expectation value of a all dagger, which expanded gives this. As a is observable, it is Hermitian, so this is equal to this. And in turn, this gives sigma a, implying that for a Hermitian, then sigma a is also Hermitian. We can of course say the same about sigma b. Also consider a state psi for our system. Next we define state psi a as equal to sigma a psi, and the state psi b as equal to sigma b psi. We can straight away use the Schwarz inequality for these two states, and we find that psi a psi a times psi b psi b is larger than or equal to the absolute value squared of psi a psi b. Let's now explore what psi a psi a is. Using its definition up here, we can write it out like this. But sigma a is Hermitian, so this is equal to sigma a squared. We can therefore write psi a psi a as equal to the expectation value of sigma a squared with respect to the state psi of our system, or in shorthand like this. In a similar manner, we can show that psi b psi b is equal to the expectation value of sigma b squared with respect to the state psi, and that psi a psi b is equal to the expectation value of sigma a sigma b with respect to the state psi. We can now replace these expressions into the Schwarz inequality, and we get that the expectation value of sigma a squared times the expectation value of sigma b squared is larger than or equal to the absolute value squared of the expectation value of sigma a times sigma b. If we remember the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, the right hand side should eventually contain a commutator. So to get a bit closer to that result, we will start by applying a useful operator identity that is very easy to prove. Consider two operators x and y. Then if you take one half times the commutator of the two operators, plus one half times the anti-commutator of the two operators, you can then expand them into these four terms. Feel free to pause here for a second to double check this. But moving on, these two terms cancel, and these two terms combine, so we get xy. So this here is a very useful result that we can use in our derivation. If we apply the equality to sigma a and sigma b instead of x and y, we get this. Let's next consider the commutator of sigma a and sigma b. Explicitly, it gives this. We can then use the definition of the sigma operators. And we can then multiply through to get these eight terms. Now definitely stop here for a second to cross-check that you're happy with this. This cancels with this, this with this, and this with this. So we end up with AB minus BA, which is simply the commutator of A and B. This means that we can write sigma A sigma B as equal to one half times the commutator of A and B, and then the anti-commutator as before. Let's now think about the properties of the two terms on the right hand side. Let's start with the commutator. If we calculate its adjoint, we can expand the commutator. Remembering that the adjoint of a product changes the order of the terms, we get this. Then a and b are Hermitian, so we get this, which is the negative of the commutator. This means that the commutator is anti Hermitian. For a general anti-Hermitian operator x, consider the complex conjugate of the expectation value. It is given by this. Then we can use the conjugation property of the scalar product. As x is anti-Hermitian, we get this. And this is minus the expectation value of x. As the complex conjugate of the expectation value of x is equal to minus the expectation value of x, this implies that the expectation value of an anti-Hermitian operator x is purely imaginary. If we now do the same for the anti-commutator, we can expand, and then using the rule for the adjoint of products and the fact that the sigmas are Hermitian, we straight away get this, which is equal to the anti-commutator. This means that the anti-commutator is Hermitian. 
for the general Hermitian operator y, we again look at the complex conjugate. Expanding, we get this. Then we use conjugation. Then the fact that y is Hermitian to get this. So it is equal to the expectation value of y. This means that for a Hermitian operator, the expectation value is purely real. So overall, for us, this means that the commutator of a and b is purely imaginary, and the anti-commutator of sigma a and sigma b is purely real. We're almost there. We just found that this term is purely imaginary, while this term is purely real. This means that the absolute value squared is trivially the sum of the squares of the two terms. So we can write that the expectation value of sigma a squared multiplied by the expectation value of sigma b squared is larger than or equal to the absolute value squared of the commutator plus the absolute value squared of the anti-commutator. Both terms on the right hand side are positive or zero, so we can drop the anti-commutator term and this new equality is still true. Taking the square root of both sides, we get this. And using the definition of the root mean square deviation, this is simply delta a delta b is larger than or equal to one half times the absolute value of the expectation value of the commutator of a and b. Yay, that's it. This is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle proved. It relates the root mean square deviations, also called uncertainties, of two operators to their commutator. This result is valid for any general pair of observables A and B. However, you'll probably be most familiar with a particular example of this principle that involves the operators of position and momentum. In this case, the commutator is equal to IH bar. Then we get delta X delta P greater than or equal to one half times the absolute value of IH bar which in turn gives delta x delta p greater than or equal to one half times h bar. I really enjoy playing with the maths, so this sort of proof is really fun for me. And I hope you also like to see where the Heisenberg uncertainty principle comes from. And don't forget to check the companion video to understand the full physical implications of the principle. And as always, please subscribe.